Sir, I, with apologies, Clifton, we're going to have to make that the last word. House of Representatives is now in session on this Friday morning. Thanks so much for being with us. Washington will be back 7 o'clock tomorrow. You are always attentive to our pleas. We need to be more attentive to your response and your commands, or we are left to ourselves. You are loving with those who love you. With those sincere, you show yourself to be sincere. With the cunning, you can undo their cunning. So shed your light upon the House of Representatives that step by step, in a unified effort, we may build a society where stability and creativity will flourish, and we may even glimpse your glory, both now and forever. Amen. Uh, the chair has examined, examined the uh, journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof, pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, uh, the journal stands approved. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? I ask for a recorded vote. Uh, the question is on agreeing to the speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor indicate by saying aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Uh, the ayes have it. The journal stands approved. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? I ask for a recorded vote, Mr. Speaker. Does the gentleman ask for the yeas and nays? Yes, sir. Uh, the A's and A's are requested. Those favoring a vote by the A's and A's will rise. A sufficient number of having arisen, the A's and A's are ordered. Uh, pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question are postponed. Uh, the pledge uh, today will be uh, led by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Altmaier. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, the chair will entertain up to five one-minute requests uh, on each side. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, uh, when future generations look back at the 112th Congress, they should be able to remember us as the Congress that made the tough decisions that got our economy back on track and restored America to greatness. That's why I fully support the commitment to cut at least $100 billion from the President's budget. We're a country that is over $14 trillion in debt, which is placing every American, regardless of political party, at serious and increasing risk. We're borrowing more than 40 percent of what we're spending. Now, my two-year-old grandson is already $45,000 in debt, and to say that our spending is simply unsustainable, that doesn't quite capture, in my mind, the gravity of our situation. To meet the deep obligation that we have to pass on to the future generations the blessings of liberty and freedom, we must act now and act decisively. That's why I'm here this morning to emphatically ask that this Congress and this session works together to find our way to $100 billion in cuts. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from New York rise? The gentlelady is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, the New Republicans' proposal to eliminate all funding for the many services provided by organizations such as Planned Parenthood are not merely anti-choice. They are also anti-health, anti-woman, and anti-poor. The Republican proposal will, would, would eliminate the Title X family planning, which gives millions of Americans' women access to primary and preventive health care. These budget cuts would deny crucial health services and cancer screening just to women. Their proposal would set up insurmountable cost barriers to family planning just for the poor. Their vision of smaller government would expand the government's power over a woman's choices. It is wrong, it is short-sighted, and it is unjust. Let's turn to the business of creating jobs and economic opportunity and away from the business of ruling other people's lives. For what purpose is the gentleman from Florida rise?
five minutes, please. Gentleman, gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I recently introduced legislation that ensures that foreign terrorists are tried in military courts instead of civilian courts like common criminals. Attorney General Holder originally wanted some terrorists, including the mastermind of 9-11, to be tried in a New York City courtroom. This proposal was soundly rejected on a bipartisan basis. My bill solves this problem. The Military Tribunal for Terrorist Act requires terrorists to be prosecuted and sentenced be before military courts. This is the appropriate, appropriate judicial review for terrorists who kill innocent men, women, and children. Classified intelligence may be made public if terrorists are given access to trial in public courtrooms. I urge all my colleagues to co-sponsor this important legislation. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise today to fulfill my side of a friendly wager with my good friends in the Wisconsin delegation to commemorate the Green Bay Packers on winning Super Bowl 45. Quarterback Aaron Rodgers was flawless, throwing for more than 300 yards and three touchdowns without an interception to earn Super Bowl MVP honors. And despite playing much of the game without injured stars Charles Woodson and Donald Driver, the Packers never trailed and ended their season by winning the trophy named after the franchise's most storied coach, Vince Lombardi. In winning Super Bowl 45, current Packer coach Mike McCarthy, a Pittsburgh native, led Green Bay to its 10th NFL championship, the most of any NFL franchise since the league first initiated a playoff system in 1933. Again, I offer my congratulations to the Green Bay Packers. For what purposes does the gentleman from Texas rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Madam Speaker, the President announced to this Congress that he would freeze all domestic spending. But this week, we heard the administration say it wants to spend billions of dollars for more high-speed rail. And that's not all. The administration wants to give wireless to everyone in the country at taxpayer expense. It sure would be nice for all Americans to be able to ride on fast choo-choos throughout the fruited plain while reading the news on their wireless iPads, but the country is out of money. Our national debt has risen over $1.7 trillion since last year. We need to focus on getting ourselves out of this crisis by cutting spending, not more spending. Ask the 44 million people living under the poverty level if they want their taxes to go to the administration's federal Polar Express. We need to cut spending, cut borrowing, cut the taxes, and cut the size of government. We are long overdue to stop subsidizing the government's special projects for its special people with money that does not exist. And that's just the way it is. For what purpose is the gentleman from Connecticut rise? Gentlemen's recognized for one minute. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This past Monday marked the one-year anniversary of the disaster at the Clean Energy Systems Power Plant in Middletown, Connecticut. That blast claimed six lives and injured dozens others last February. It could have been prevented. Unsafe pipe cleaning procedures and poor ventilation helped ignite a basketball arena's worth of natural gas in an explosion that could be heard across a 30-mile radius in central Connecticut. And one of the six plant construction workers who lost their lives that day hailed from Thomaston, Connecticut, in my district, Peter Chapulis. And as we look back on the terrible events of February 7th last year, it's up to us to honor Peter's memory and those who died alongside him by ensuring that disasters like this never happen again. The cost of powering our homes and businesses should never be measured in lives. Industry and government alike failed Peter that cold winter morning, and we have much work ahead of us to right that wrong. While those who lost loved ones in Middletown a year ago will never be made whole again, we owe them our diligence and our best work to make sure that it never happens again. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose is gentleman from Virginia rise? Gentleman's recognized. Madam Speaker, last year we passed a two-year, $850 billion tax cut bill with the benefits skewed towards millionaires. $24 billion of that was a bonus reduction in taxes on estates of multimillionaires over and above the generous reduction that most had expected. When the bill passed, many of us asked how we were going to pay for it. Well, now we know. 
This week, the Republican majority released a list of spending cuts, and look how we're going to pay for it. Cuts in, spending, cuts in heating assistance for low-income families, job training programs, National Institute for Health, NASA Research, community health centers, and women, infant, and children's nutrition programs. Mr. Speak, Madam Speaker, the worst part is that the savings from the 70 programs slated to be cut only total $23 billion, less than the cost of the bonus estate tax changes for dead multimillionaires, a long way from the $100 billion demanded by the Tea Party, nowhere close to paying the $850 billion tax cut bill, and it doesn't fix the long-term structural imbalance in the federal budget. Madam Speaker, that's not right. For what purpose is the gentleman from California raised? The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise with serious concerns with the lack of debate in this House. I was taught growing up that there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. The right way is to look before you leap. We are not today looking at the consequences of our actions. Reckless cuts are as dangerous as reckless spending. On one side, the Democrats talk about creating more jobs. On the other side, they talk about is the race to the bottom in fiscal cuts. Think about it. You can't create jobs by removing the foundation that creates an educated workforce. Cutting access to education won't create more jobs. Cutting job training won't create a more competitive workforce. Cutting social safety nets won't save lives. Not having hearings on the impacts of our, of our cuts is not a smart thing to do. That's why my granddaughter reminds me we should stop, look, and listen before we cross the street. But not the new Congress, which does not embrace, which embraces a race to the bottom rather than an informed reductions. We should not, we should look before we leap. It might save jobs and lives. Pursuant to Clause 1C of Rule 19, consideration of House Resolution 72 will now resume, which the clerk will report by title. House Calendar Number 6, House Resolution 72, resolution directing certain standing committees to inventory and review existing, pending, and proposed regulations and orders from agencies of the federal government, particularly with respect to their effect on jobs and economic growth. When consideration was postponed on Thursday, February 10, uh, 2011, four hours of debate remained on the resolution, with th three hours equally divided and controlled by the chairs and ranking minority members of the Committee on the Judiciary, Agriculture, and Oversight and Government Reform, and one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority members of the Committee on Education and the Workforce, and the Majority Leader and Minority Leader or their designees. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, two years ago and two years into the current administration, Washington policies have not rescued our economy from crisis. In fact, they have entrenched the crisis. American workers and American companies pay the price as Washington regulations stifle job creation and slow economic recovery. The Judiciary Committee doesn't have jurisdiction over sweeping economic regulations, but it does have jurisdiction over something that sweeps with just as much force. That is the administrative law that governs how agencies must respond to Congress and what agencies must consider before they regulate at all. The RAINS Act enables us to reassert Congress's authority over the most burdensome regulations that our agencies churn out. 
These are major regulations, those that impose a burden of $100 million or more on our economy. The RAINS Act requires Congress, not an unelected agency head, to decide whether regulations with massive costs become the law of the land. The Judiciary Committee has already begun hearings on the RAINS Act and intends to move quickly to mark up this legislation. Small businesses are the heart of job creation. Rather than bend to small businesses' needs, Washington too often rigidly demands that small businesses bend to Washington. Overbearing, one-size-fits-all federal regulations have long been the order of the day. Small businesses cannot bear their weight. Since small businesses are the engine of job creation, it is clear what suffers, that is, jobs. This week, I introduced the Regulatory Flexibility Improvements Act of 2011 to force federal agencies to accommodate the needs of small businesses. Yesterday, the Judiciary Committee held a hearing on the bill, and it intends to mark up that bill soon. Let's reform the, administration, excuse me, let's reform the Administrative Procedure Act, the fundamental charter for all agency rulemaking. While it is not time to retire the APA, it is past time to strengthen it with common sense reforms. We should make permanent cost-benefit analysis requirements that presidents have developed through executive orders. Practice has proved that cost-benefit analysis improves regulatory effectiveness and lowers regulatory cost. But an executive order, no matter how wise, can be revoked by the next resident of the White House. Other vital reforms also must take place. Agency's favorite and almost universal course under the APA is informal notice and comment rulemaking. This procedure is certainly convenient and it does have its place. But under its shelter, it has long been too easy for big government to impose hard-hitting rules without sufficiently vetting them. This should change. We should consider tougher requirements that agencies must demonstrate a need for regulations. Congress and the courts provide daily proof that evidence tested with witnesses at hearings produces the best judgments. Why shouldn't agencies use formal rulemaking hearings to evaluate the need for major regulations that cost hundreds of millions of dollars? We also should make sure the public has earlier opportunities to comment on potential agency action. Public input should come well before agency positions harden into settled but often under-informed judgments. Under traditional one-time notice and comment procedures, agency decisions are too often made before public comment even happens. President Obama has embraced a number of these principles with both spoken and written words. So I hope we will have bipartisan support for our efforts to pass meaningful legislation that will help create jobs. And Madam Speaker, I'll uh, reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, is recognized. Top of the morning, Madam Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. And the gentleman I, is recognized for such time as he may consume. And I am uh, uh, curious about the uh, reference and surprise that my friend, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, would uh, come to the floor in this discussion and lift up the RAINS Act as a way that we may uh, prevent the uh, regulations for inhibiting jobs. Uh, uh, dear friends, under the RAINS Act, uh, we would be violating the separation of powers doctrine that I'm, I'm sure that members of the Judiciary Committee, particularly my friend, the chairman and ranking member for many years, uh, would be familiar with. The RAIN Act, uh, which we have under consideration in our committee, would be the last thing we would want to enact in this Congress uh, to create more jobs. The last thing. 
Uh, I am surprised that that the separations of powers doctrine is now required for me to explain on the House floor uh, about a 1988 case entitled Morris v. Olson, 487 U.S. Page 654, uh, that the Reigns case would be constitutionally uh, in uh, would would be constitutionally infirm, and that the Reigns Act would would be a terrible thing for us to do if you're serious about jobs. Supporters of the Reigns Act argue that Congress, and the chairman has said this, that Congress has delegated too much authority over the years to what they call unelected bureaucrats in the executive branch. Of course, they're appointed, uh, creating thereby a lack of accountability among federal agencies and resulting in burdensome regulations. Uh, the RAINS Act uh, does not address uh, the, even the problem that they're arguing about. Uh, some might argue that there's a, a need to strike a balance between protecting the safety and health of all Americans and fostering economic growth and job creation. But the President of the United States has already anticipated this need uh, with his issuance just days ago on the executive order improving regulation and regulatory review. I, ask, uh, I, I intend to put this in the record at the appropriate time which directs agencies to consider the concerns in, these concerns in promulgating rules. But the bill that the chairman of the committee refers to would not achieve this balance. Rather, it will distort the rulemaking process and will hamper implementation of every single law on the books by changing the presumption in the Congressional Review Act and requiring affirmative congressional approval uh, for all major rules. This act will serve as a chokehold and stifle regulatory review, which may in fact be the real intent of uh, Reins legislation. And so uh, I uh, must respectfully uh, hope that all of the members of this House will carefully review the RAINS Act, which will be coming up for a vote in the committee. We've had the hearings, and, and uh, I, I'd like you to all weigh in on this because nothing could be more seriously destructive to trying to create jobs than doing what is proposed in that bill. And Madam Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Uh, the gentleman from Texas. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Coble, who is also chairman of the Administrative Law Subcommittee. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for three minutes. I thank the distinguished chairman from Texas for yielding. I appreciate that. And I rise in strong support, uh, Madam Speaker, of this resolution. It's been far too long since the Congress conducted a comprehensive review of our regulatory policies and procedures. I'm not here today to be a demagogue or an accuser, but it appears that many of our regulations simply become another cost of doing business in America. My district is no different from many others. We're suffering from the recession, and while we once claimed many manufacturing and producing distinctions, a significant number of di directly related jobs have either disappeared or gone elsewhere. This situation has grown, has grown so dire 
the general feeling in many places in America is that if the government wants to hold you in violation, the chances are trouble is imminent. I support public safety, public health, safe work conditions, and other areas covered by federal regulations, but I simply do not agree with those who feel that the only problem with our regulations is that they're not enough. This mentality, Madam Speaker, is exactly what has gone wrong with many of our regulations. I have no doubt that if we clean our regulatory system, new business and investments will be forthcoming in America. And I believe we can do this in such a way as to reinforce good, sound regulations. The Judiciary Committee, Madam Speaker, has jurisdiction over the Administrative Procedures Act and many other areas of the Commercial Code, which can be improved without compromising consumer interests. A lot is at stake here. And this is not a fight between businesses and their regulators. It's a fight, Madam Speaker, for the American dream, that a business, an entrepreneur or innovator can have an idea, perhaps a dream, and then fully pursue it. I'm not implying that the sky is falling, but the reality is disappointing indeed. Our country is becoming less conducive for economic growth and a major contributing factor, in my opinion, is the failure of our regulatory system. I hope we can change this very soon, Madam Speaker. And I say to the gentleman from Texas, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased now to yield to the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Courts and Administration, uh, the, the distinguished gentleman from Tennessee, Steve Cohen, as much time as he may consume. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for as much time as he may. As thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the ranking member for the time. Uh, my committee, Courts, Commercial, and Administrative Law, has uh, had hearings on these bills, the RAINS Act, as well as the, as well as the uh, uh, regulatory reform bills that have been proposed. And the RAINS Act would require all measures that have a cost of $100 million or more before their regulations go into effect, within 70 days of the promulgation of those regulations, they'd have to be approved by a positive vote of this House and our equal, and equal House, the Senate, and signed by the President before they go in to effect. The reality, Madam Speaker, is this would stifle government and stifle growth because, as we've seen, the Senate has difficulty doing much of anything within 70 days. In fact, it had difficulty doing much in two years. And to ask the Senate where any one senator can put down a slip on a judicial nomination or hold up legislation if they so choose unless they get what they desire and want, the last vestige in reality that we have in this country of don't ask, don't tell, don't ask the senator what they want, and don't tell what they got, all of these regulations would be at the whim and caprice of any one individual senator. That's not what the American public wants. The American public wants the government to work. They want the House and Senate to work. They don't want the system in the Senate to where one senator can kill almost anything, to where Senator No can stop the government from actively promoting the general health, welfare, safety of the American public. Now, the RAINS Act wasn't needed, apparently, during the time that George Bush was president. And yet there were more regulations and rules during that time than there had been during President Obama's time as president. It's interesting to note that my colleagues on the other side understood the separation of powers doctrine and the fact that the Article II allows the executive to carry out and administer the laws, and they should be able to do so. But once President Obama came into office and there was financial services reform, the financial services reform we needed because without regulations, the financial services sector almost took this country into another Great Depression. They did take us into a Great Recession, costing us jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs. 
The high unemployment rate is the result of the lack of regulation in the housing industry and the financial service industry, where those two work together to almost bring down this nation's economy and the world's economy. To where we had a day when President Bush brought us the TARP to save our economy. And in a bipartisan fashion, we passed the TARP that Secretary Paulson told us we had to pass because we were on the brink, as President Bush also said, of financial collapse. Yes, financial collapse because of the lack of regulation. And yet, in this Congress, the 112th, we're being asked to say that no regulations would take effect unless the House and the Senate, that body known not for its alacrity, but for its quote-unquote deliberateness, would have to act and positively pass something within 70 days. Health care legislation, regulations couldn't go into effect to keep young people on their parents' insurance until they're 26 unless the Senate acted within 70 days. Pre-existing conditions would continue to be an impediment for children to get insurance and to be treated. Lifetime caps would continue to exist because we couldn't get regulations approved within 70 days. The fact is it's the executive's responsibility to carry out the laws that the Congress passes. The Congress is not the executive. And because Barack Obama is president is no reason to change what the Founding Fathers set up as a great document with three separate and equal branches of government. Being challenged now, the RAINS Act would go back on what the Founding Fathers wanted. It would go back on the Constitution, which we spent time reading on this floor, the entire Constitution, that included Article II, the powers of the executive, an equal branch of government to the legislature. And the RAINS Act would say that the Constitution doesn't matter, that the Congress, the legislative branch that's supposed to promote, pass the laws, will also be a part of executing the laws. I hold the Constitution in high regard and don't believe we should shred it because we want to have an opportunity to slow up financial regulations passed as part of the Dodd-Frank bill and health care for the American public. The whole idea of this review of regulations that we've gotten and this discussion on this floor of the House has taken this House from a place where the American public doesn't watch the Congress make laws and make improvements to create jobs and to improve the welfare of the American public, but it makes it a debating society because we already have the power to re review rules and we do it in Judiciary Committee and we do it in all committees. But now we're going to have reality television and C-SPAN, instead of watching us pass laws, is going to watch us discuss what we already have been doing, always do, and are supposed to do, which is review regulations and have oversight, but not veto over the executive. So, Madam Speaker, it is with great regret that I participate in this debate, because this debate is not a part of a law and an action and a bill to improve the American public, but simply a political show. And with all due respect to the chairman of the committee and the members who have brought this legislation, it violates the Constitution, which we read. That shouldn't have been a show. That should have been something we held deeply to our hearts. This violates the Constitution and the powers of Article II. I yield back and reserve the balance the of my time. The gentleman yields back. The uh, gentleman from Texas. Uh, Madam right Speaker, there. I'll yield myself 30 seconds. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, I just want to point out uh, to my friends on the uh, other side of the aisle and to those who are watching this debate that both Supreme Court Justice Breyer and well-known and well-regarded Professor Larry Tribe have written supporting the constitutional basis of the RAINS Act. It is clearly constitutional. It is clearly going to create jobs. Uh, by the way, that's as opposed to the new health care bill, which the CBO said yesterday was actually going to cost 800,000 jobs. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll now yield three minutes to my colleague from Texas, Mr. Poe. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for three minutes. I thank the chairman for yielding. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the nation is overregulated. 
you talk to any business owner, small or big, one of the first things they will talk to you about is the massive amount of federal regulations that are imposed on them, many of them making no sense, but costing them money. And of course, that cost is always transferred down to the consumer, the American citizen. I have tried to find out in the last few days how many regulations there are. Nobody knows. We can't find anybody in Washington that can give us an exact number of how many. One uh, person that I trust uh, said that there are over 300,000 federal regulations that have punitive fines for failure to abide by that regulation. That's a lot of regulations. It seems to me, and this is just my opinion, that down the street where the bureaucrats work in those offices, and we don't know who those people are, they get up every morning, they go into a room, they sit around a big conference table, drink coffee, and they say, who can we regulate today? And they write out another regulation and pass it down to the fruited plain and make the American citizen comply with that regulation. Some regulations are probably pretty good. Some probably are not so good. And it's our duty as representatives of the people to control and regulate the regulators. That is our job. I believe that is our constitutional requirement since we allow these agencies to exist in the administration. It seems to me the federal government should help business, not get in the way of business. And we should stop and start our job of doing away with burdensome regulations that don't help the country. Uh, this law allows Congress to review by means of an expedited legislative process federal regulations issued by the government agencies and by passage of a joint resolution to overrule a regulation. We should have oversight over those regulations. The health care bill is a, probably a pretty good example of this overregulation. Regardless of where we are on that issue, it brings about new, massive, expensive regulations. Uh, Section 906 of H.R. 3590 will require business owners to submit a separate 1099 form for every single business transaction that they have with another business that totals more than $600 a year. Now, what that means, you've got a business, and they deal with other businesses. If they deal with them more than $600 a year, which many businesses do, they've got to file out 1099 form. And the legislation also allows uh, for a enforcement under the... The gentleman's time. Madam Speaker, I'll yield the gentleman an additional two minutes. Gentleman's recognized for two minutes. It's expensive regulation that makes no sense. Why should all this paperwork be sent up to Washington so bureaucrats can review it? I don't understand the logic. It makes no sense. It costs money. But the bill also requires 16,000 new IRS agents to oversee the individual mandate requirement that every person must uh, comply with. I think that mandate's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court eventually decide. But why do we need 16,000 new IRS agents under the health care bill? I think that's overregulation. And in fact, the Congressional Budget Office, as my friend and chairman from Texas uh, said, uh, the director, Elmendorf, yesterday testified that the health care bill will cost 800,000 jobs for Americans. He said that yesterday. So the bill's not going to help the economy. It's not going to help get jobs. It's going to cost us $800,000 or 800,000 jobs. These are some reasons why I think Congress has the obligation to review the reg regulatory process and to get our house in order and probably eliminate a few of those 300,000 expensive regulations that are imposed upon businesses and on citizens. And with that, I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield myself uh, as much time as I may consume before I recognize the distinguished gentlelady from Houston. Because uh, Judge Poe, uh, if he is still here, uh, has raised the first uh, in the time allotted Judiciary Committee, has raised two specific uh, grievances about overregulation, uh, diminishing job opportunity. 
and the one was on the 1099 form, uh, which I am going to examine more carefully. And the other was about the fact that the Health Care Reform Act frequently derogatorily referred as the Obamacare Act, uh, but which I call the Obamacare Act because I think it's going to go down in history as a major accomplishment of the president uh, within the first two years of his office. He said it would cost 800,000 jobs. I would like to ask him or anyone in the House uh, for any evidence uh, that there is a 800,000 job uh, expense because uh, the health care bill uh, that both sides refer to as Obamacare now uh, create jobs because we're adding uh, 30, we're adding many more people to the health care system which ladies and gentlemen are going to require more doctors, more nurses, more clinics, more hospitals. Uh, how on earth can we uh, uh, ex uh, expand the provisions of health care which incidentally should apply to every American in this country and then say that it's going to reduce the number of jobs. I, I, I think that logic defies uh, explanation, but I would yield to anybody that would like to explain it to me. And I yield to the gentleman from the Judiciary Committee, the chairman of the committee. Um, I thank my friend, the ranking member, for yielding. Uh, the source of the information uh, that I have used and Judge Poe used saying that the health care bill was going to cost 800,000 uh, jobs was a report yesterday released by the Congressional Budget Office saying that the health care bill would cost 800,000 jobs. The CBO, as we all know, is an independent, credible, outside uh, agency. Uh, upon whom we rely for information on a regular basis. And for them to come out and say the health care bill is going to cost 800,000 uh, jobs uh, is uh, quite frankly uh, believable and the reason why I think we can cite them as a credible source. And well, I, th uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Well, you're welcome. And uh, I, I frequently uh, cite them as a credible source myself. But would my chairman of the committee explain how we ensure millions of more people and then with fewer and fewer people. Did the, did the CBO explain uh, anything in their discussion of this job loss of how uh, the health care system would ex be ex ex considerably expanded but yet at the same time lose jobs, they would do it with less people. Can, can the chairman of the committee assist me in understanding that apparent disconnect and I yield? Right. Um, would the gentleman yield again? Uh, I can't uh, explain the disconnect because I don't think there is a disconnect, but we can certainly supply you with the testimony that was offered by the CBO yesterday uh, in which they said it would cost 800,000 jobs. And we'll look for a copy of that testimony or uh, the other judiciary staff members might be able to supply us with a copy of that testimony as well. But uh, I don't think there's a disconnect. I believe the CBO. I do believe that the health care bill is going to cost 800,000 jobs. I thank the gentleman for yielding. You're welcome. I, I'm pleased now to uh, recognize the distinguished gentle lady from Houston, Texas, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, a senior member of the committee for as much time as she may consume. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for such time as she may consume. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let me thank Mr. Conyers uh, for yielding, and I think it's important that we explain to our colleagues what we're doing here. Uh, this is part of a seven or nine hour marathon for uh, committees of jurisdiction to come to the floor to respond to how important it is to, in essence, clog up the government. It sounds pretty and it sounds attractive to be able to suggest that we have not been uh, exercising due diligence as relates to the regulatory process of the executive branch. 
And my colleague from Tennessee was right. When we cite the Constitution, what we are saying is that the Founding Fathers recognized the importance of three distinct branches. The legislative rights legislation and has the right to oversight and uh, those who are part of this body are elected uh, to represent certain perspectives. The executive is elected by all of the people, electing the President of the United States and the third branch, the judiciary branch, has oversight. So what we have taken to the floor to do is to spend nine hours uh, in redundancy uh, talking about what this body should be doing anyhow. We have the responsibility of oversight. Uh, we have the ability to question regulations uh, in regular order. But what we will be doing is ignoring the people's business of creating jobs and frankly putting ourselves uh, in the role of a clogged toilet, meaning that we're doing nothing. We're stuffed up. So I would make the argument that the RAINS Act, maybe through good intentions, uh, is a dilatory tactic that keeps us from doing our work. Let me give you a few examples as a member of the House Judiciary Committee. One of the subcommittees that I have the privilege of sitting on is a committee, and I thank uh, Chairman Smith for uh, designing this committee again, dealing with competitiveness. What could be more important than assessing whether or not this country is losing its competitiveness uh, to uh, countries around the world or that corporations are doing non-competitive acts that causes us to lose jobs. I'm not happy with the United Continental merger. We've just lost jobs in Houston, 500 of them. I would prefer us continuing to have oversight over whether these large type mergers cause us to lose jobs. There are any number of merging industries that believe that's the best way to go. And therefore, I would welcome that opportunity. Mr. Conyers, I understand that the mayor of New York is suggesting that Germany should take over Wall Street. I'm offended. I'm hurt. Not that I have anything against Germany, but I know that there is a type of intellectual property that is possessed, uh, if nothing else, the pride of Wall Street as it relates to the body politic of finance in this country and around the world. I would like to have a hearing as to whether or not that is detrimental to the loss of jobs or whether, in fact, uh, it diminishes the competitiveness of this nation. That is what the Judiciary Committee has powers to do. If you put this bill in place, and might I concede, I don't mind conceding that something is going to pass, but I, I hope that there is a thought process that recognizes that staff has indicated to us that last year under this rule there were 94 major regulations that this body would have to attend to. So we would have eliminated our work on food safety. We would have had to eliminate our work on Wall Street reform. We would have had to eliminate our work on ensuring that Americans get good health care in order to stop the work of this body to address a regulation that we would have every right in an oversight process to handle. Then, as a member of the Crime Subcommittee, I want you to be aware of the fact that I've been told by representatives of the Federal Prison Bureau that our federal prison now houses more convicted international and domestic terrorists than, Con than Guantanamo, excuse me, Guantanamo Bay. But yet, we're at a hiring freeze. We don't have enough uh, prison, Federal Bureau of Prison Corrections officers in order to ensure as a rising inmate population, nothing that I'm proud of, continues to grow, the ratio of prison uh, correction officers, federal, diminishes. You can see it in the state, the tragedy in Washington state, not enough officers in a state prison and a prison officer is killed. We need to have hearings on how we can address the crisis in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I might say that would add jobs. We need more individuals there to protect them who are doing 
of serving their country as being part of the Federal Bureau of Prisons system, creating jobs. Why are we not attending to that? When you have to address major regulation and stop the business of this House to either hold a hearing in committee or 15 days is discharged to the floor, we have to debate it on the floor, that's what we'll be doing. Rather than engaging in the legislative process, we write the laws. And I might say that I have a great deal of respect for CBO, but I also know that they are not without vulnerabilities and they are not without imperfections. If there's 800,000 jobs being lost, are they being lost throughout industry because of certain requirements? And then on the other hand, some 3 million plus jobs may be created uh, because of the access to health care and the increase uh, in uh, resources for more doctors and nurses, health technicians, providing scholarship dollars, more community health clinics that will employ people. It doesn't make sense. It's an oxymoron to suggest that you're going to have a finite loss of 8,000, 800,000, but you're not going to be able to increase. Now let me add, I'm on judiciary and this is what we're here for. So I've already cited to you that I'd like the competitive committee to be addressing the questions of whether mergers are still good for America and the American and the working people. Whether or not our intellectual property that is being hacked and stolen is diminishing the ability for American workers to work. Whether or not even entertaining selling Wall Street is a rational approach to take. And then let me uh, get on a more controversial subject. Someone would make the argument, no, this, this couldn't be a job creator. But we have been frustrated by the immigration system for now the lifetime of my tenure in Congress. We have had the pros and cons, or we have been mad at the 1996 reform and the 1980s reform. Uh, and some of us have get, continued to press one refrain that we must do security, border security, and also a comprehensive approach to immigration. Some would argue that that absolutely cannot create jobs, but I will tell you, why are we not fully addressing the broken immigration system in this nation? If we pull at the heartstrings of many members of Congress who will proudly speak of their German heritage, their Irish heritage, uh, their Hispanic, uh, Latino heritage, African-American heritage, Asian heritage, uh, heritage from all around the world. They will point to the fact that they came from somewhere. We understand that if we can regularize this broken immigration system, not only do we have individuals legitimately investing in America through Social Security and taxes, but Immigrants, new immigrants, also create jobs for others. And it builds an economy, the agricultural economy, for example, that is playing hide-and-seek with workers who they have to hire. Hide-and-seek, because they don't have a regularized system. Our agricultural industry, one of the greatest in the world, in fact, the greatest. We can feed the world. I applaud our family farmers and the industry that has grown. I've always admired being able to do something with the land. We could be addressing an immigration reform system that puts people to work, that allows the agricultural industry to grow and thrive and build jobs. In fact, I was listening to a colleague from the other side of the aisle uh, who indicated uh, he had come out of the agricultural industry as a, a farm or uh, land that is doing agricultural work, Mr. Conyers and Mrs. Smith, uh, and he said that we have not been hampered by the economy. We are thriving. We could grow. So if we put an immigration system in place, the work of the Judiciary Committee, we create jobs. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? So I ask my colleagues, as my ranking member has said, to thoughtfully think of this particular resolution, the RAINS Act. It is truly that. I would add that it will strangle with the RAINS the work of this body and the work of the Judiciary Committee, and it will not create any jobs. We'll be stifled, dead in our tracks, working with one regulation after another. And what I'd like to say, if you've got a bad regulation, send it to the Judiciary Committee. We can handle it. But I don't want to see corporations getting away with criminal activity, which we could address in the Subcommittee on Crime. I don't want to see us getting away uh, with food safety problems because we're not addressing it. Uh, Madam Speaker, let me just say, 
Uh, this is a lot of great intentions, and I have a great respect for my colleagues. This institution is one that I love, but I frankly believe we can do better in this House, and the President of the United States and the administration don't deserve this. What we do deserve is a hard fight uh, to reduce the deficit uh, and to build on jobs and to serve the people back home who are struggling with their own problems and need this government to respond to the needs of education, health care, and science, and many other issues. With that, Madam Speaker, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Texas. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, Madam Speaker, I just want to say to my Texas colleague who just spoke uh, that I know and appreciate how strongly she feels about uh, saving jobs in Houston, creating jobs in Houston, as I do too. But we heard yesterday from the CBO that this new health care bill is going to cost America 800,000 jobs. And it just so happens if you prorate that out, uh, that would mean that the new health care bill will cost Houston, Texas around 600 jobs. And of course, it will cost other communities around the country jobs as well. So the best way to try to save jobs in Houston, the best way to try to prevent jobs from being lost in Houston would be to vote to repeal the health care. Would the gentleman bill. yield? Now, the gentlewoman Would from the gentleman Texas yield? also, not yet, the gentleman from Texas also raised the subject of immigration. I wasn't aware that that was connected to this bill, but I'm also happy to uh, reply to her comments about that subject as well. Uh, today in America, there are roughly 7 million people who are working illegally in this country. Uh, they are taking jobs that should go to the 26 million Americans who are either unemployed or underemployed. So once again, if we want to create jobs for Americans in this country, one way to do so would be to make sure that only legal workers are employed in this country and we have ways to accomplish that end. Um, Madam Speaker, I'm now going to yield three the minutes yield? to the gentleman from South would Carolina. The gentleman yield? Missed, um, I'll continue, and then maybe he'll be able to yield in just a minute. But I want to yield three minutes to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, who is the vice chairman of the Administrative Law Subcommittee. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise in support of HRS 72, but I also want to commend uh, the distinguished gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, for not only his leadership on this issue, but also the judicious way in which he leads our committee on judiciary. The Constitution gives Congress limited but critical functions. The very same Constitution that we all swore an allegiance to when we took the oath, the very same Constitution that we read when we started the 112th Congress, gives important, limited, critical functions to Congress. And one of those functions is to pass laws that are easily understood and reasonably enforced. It is not the function of this body to merely pass broad ideas and leave it up to someone else, an unelected official in the executive branch, to fill in the details. And make no mistake, I do not blame those in the executive branch. I blame the Congress of the United States for abdicating its responsibility. Nature abhors a vacuum. And one look at our Code of Federal Regulations, and I encourage anyone Anyone who challenges this or doubts it, go to your local library and look at the Code of Federal Regulation and you will see that that vacuum created by this body has been more than filled by the executive branch. The labyrinth that has become this nation's regulatory scheme has exported jobs, imported litigation, all the while eroding the very limited amount of public trust that is left in the institutions of government. We had a witness Madam Speaker, in judiciary yesterday, and I asked him a very simple question. When you get a call from a member of the executive branch who works with a regulatory agency, is your first impression that he or she is there to help or to accuse? And this representative of middle America, a businessman from Kentucky, without hesitation said they are there to accuse. It is an adversarial relationship between the regulators and our business creators. We do not and should not leave it to the FBI to decide what is bank robbery. We do not and should not leave it to the Drug Enforcement Administration to decide which controlled substances under Title 21 are or not. That is a function of laws, at least not yet in this republic. Yet we let regulatory agencies decide the very details that either create 
or destroy the environment that is conducive to creating jobs. While other Congresses may have delegated and abdicated, we must reclaim the responsibility to govern and legislate and the accountability that is attendant thereto. And HRS 72 does exactly that, and I am pleased to rise in its support. I thank the gentleman from Texas. The gentleman yields back. The, uh, the gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Mr. Madam Speaker, uh, I'd like to uh, yield to uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, as much time as she may consume. Gentlemen, a gentleman.